morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And it's my great pleasure to warmly welcome you to the IEA's annual State of the Economy Conference, uh, a real highlight uh, of the Institute's calendar. Uh, just a few words of introduction about the Institute of Economic Affairs itself. I think you'll all find um, on your seat or on your chair uh, an IEA bag with a, a few goodies in it, uh, one of our publications, one of our recent magazines, and an introductory brochure. The Institute of Economic Affairs exists to promote uh, the public understanding of the role that free markets play in solving social and economic pro uh, problems. We run an extensive series of events across the year. This is one of uh, our great highlights, of our, as I've already mentioned, but it's one of about 100 events that we run. Uh, many in association with Market Force, who have organised this conference today. We also produce a whole range of research papers. We consistently make our case in the media, and we have an extensive student and teacher outreach programme. If you'd like to know more about our activities or be put on our mailing list, please make sure that you drop a business card or a note with your email address on it in the bowl, which is now on the desk where you registered at the outset. Today's event, I hope you will agree, has a fantastic lineup of speakers, and my thanks go out to all of them in advance of what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating series of presentations. I'd also like to make particular mention of Luxembourg Financial Group, our principal sponsors today, whose generosity has enabled us to uh, have so many uh, students here on bursary places and indeed uh, other IEA donors and supporters who've generously contributed to allow us to have students here with us today. Now, over the last year or so, I suppose it's been the government's cuts that have dominated the economic agenda. But in 2011, much of the attention has turned to the prospects of for economic growth and recovery returning to our economy. And many of the discussions today are going to focus on what the prospects look like for our economic recovery and indeed what the government should be considering uh, doing in order to make the recovery really happen. Now, of course, the government can't just pull levers or wave a magic wand to bring economic growth to the United Kingdom. If they could, they would have done that long ago. But they can perhaps set some of the environmental backdrop to actually allow businesses to flourish and to provide the circumstances in which uh, a solid economic recovery becomes more likely. I hope you have a great and enjoyable day. Uh, I think that you, I'm sure you will find the speakers we have on offer fascinating. I hope you learn a lot. I hope you contribute a lot too. We have plenty of time for questions and engagement. So enjoy yourself uh, and um, I hope you have a fantastic conference. I'd now like to hand over to Sam who's going to chair our first session. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sam Fleming. I'm economics editor of The Times, and uh, welcome to our first session, which provides, uh, hopefully, a, a fascinating whistle-stop tour of three major themes in the global economy at the moment with three of the most prominent people uh, in the field. Uh, first off, we have Andrew Sentence, who's a Monetary Policy Committee member at the Bank of England. Uh, second, Roger Bootle, who's Managing Director of Capital Economics. And third, we have uh, Jim O'Neill, who's uh, the Chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. I'm going to go straight, however, to Andrew for his speech. Andrew, as you all know, has become one of Britain's, probably Britain's most prominent interest rate hawk um, over the past uh, few months, starting from June uh, of last year. He's been fighting a lonely battle uh, for higher interest rates, which was joined uh, in January by Martin Wheel, and I think most people would expect more people to be joining him over the coming months. So Andrew will now give us uh, the latest state of uh, play from where he sits. Well, thanks very much for that introduction. And um, it's always nice to be a warm-up speaker for Roger Bootle, which is often my, my role in life, um, and particularly at these conferences, it seems to me. Um, and it's always a great pleasure to speak at this conference. Uh, it's amazing that this is the, is it the 28th State of the Economy Conference. Um, I'm not sure that means it's been running for 28 years. I think there may be some times when there were two a year. Um, but uh, I, I think I've spoken at this conference going back for about 20 years, so it's good to be back. Um, aficionados of 1970s rock music will maybe recognise a phrase in my title, 
um, selling England by the pound. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but I want to first start off with yesterday's announcements from the Bank of England's latest quarterly inflation report, which showed a very large upward revision in the short-term outlook for inflation. Though despite this, the forecasts published in the report still show inflation coming broadly back to target next year, with the upside and downside risks to the medium-term inflation outlook roughly balanced. And that view of inflation prospects underpinned the committee's decision last week that bank rates should be kept at its record low level of 0.5%, despite persistently high and rising inflation. Now, in my view, this medium-term assessment of the outlook for inflation in the uh, latest inflation report is too optimistic. As both the Governor's letter on Tuesday and the latest inflation report make clear, there are significant differences of view on the MPC at present. And my judgment is that the upside risks to inflation are understated in the published fan charts, and monetary policy would most likely need to be tightened faster and by more than the markets currently expect to bring inflation back to target. Now, you'll not be surprised to hear that I hold these views. Um, as the Chairman has said, since last summer, I've been arguing that a gradual tightening of UK monetary policy was needed sooner rather than later. And I also argued um, that delaying policy action in the second half of last year would mean bigger and sharper interest rate rises than eventually uh, would be needed to control inflation. And I'm sad to say um, that this warning is being borne out by events. I think we would be better placed to head off the upside pressures on inflation, which are now apparent, if we had taken earlier policy action. And the risk is that when policy tightening does start, it will be overdue, and the MPC will be playing catch-up, which is not a good scenario for recovery prospects. Now, in today's speech, I want to highlight why I believe there are bigger upside risks to the medium-term inflation outlook than the current uh, inflation report forecast acknowledges. And I want to talk in particular about the inflationary impetus um, provided by the very substantial decline in sterling since 2007 and how that decline should be viewed in the context of the monetary policy issues we now face, hence my title here. Now, January's CPI inflation number continues a run of persistent above target UK inflation, which has persisted for nearly five years now as this chart shows. Indeed, during my time as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, um, since October 2006, CPI inflation has been below target for only two brief periods, which you can see uh, on this chart, for three months in 2007 and for six months in the second half of 2009. And that's despite the fact that below target inflation has been the medium term central projection in every inflation report forecast since August 2008, which is quite a long time. Um, indeed, the inflation forecast published a year ago in February 2010 suggested that by now CPI inflation would be around 1% in the first half of this year, whereas it has already hit 4% and is set to move higher. Now, higher VAT can account for part of this significant upside forecast error, but it's not the only element at work. And the response of consumer prices to the recent VAT rise appears to be part of a broad pattern in which consumers have suffered cost and price increases from a wide range of sources, despite the recent expectation that um, the recession would bear down heavily on inflation. So why has inflation turned out persistently above target, despite this widespread expectation? And why has the Bank of England done such a poor job of forecasting it in recent inflation reports? Now, in my view, the answers to these questions are closely related. Inflation has run persistently above target because the upward impetus of global price pressures and the fall in the pound have been much stronger than any downward pressure we have seen from spare capacity in the aftermath of the recession. Similarly, in the bank's inflation forecast, too much faith is being put on a large output gap, pushing down on inflation, and not enough weight has been put on the upward pressure from the global environment and the exchange rate. And this tendency to overweight the downward pull of spare capacity in the UK and underweight the upward impact of external inflationary pressures is behind the big upside forecast errors that have been made over a number of years. And it also underpins the over-optimistic assessment of the medium-term inflation outlook 
in the current set of forecasts published yesterday. Now, at the heart of the Bank of England's approach to forecasting inflation and that of many other forecasters is the well-known output gap of inflation, output gap model of inflation. While many other factors affect the forecast published in the inflation report, most of these drop out of the projections after a year or so. Longer-term inflation expectations are also important, but these are generally assumed to be well anchored around the inflation target. Hence, the assessment of the output gap or the margin of spare capacity tends to dominate the medium-term view of inflation published in the bank's inflation report. The output gap model explains deviations in inflation from its target level based on fluctuations of economic growth around its trend or capacity level. According to this view, strong growth puts upward pressure on prices and costs, whereas if growth is weak or the economy moves into recession, spare capacity pushes down on prices and costs. Hence, the persistent forecasts that inflation would fall back towards target and the expectation that it would be pushed below in the aftermath of the recent recession. But as this chart shows, there's been very little sign of this output gap effect at work on inflation through the recession and its aftermath. And there are four reasons why inflation hasn't followed the course predicted by the output gap. And for the same reasons, we should be wary of forecasts that it will do so in the future, especially when the recovery is more firmly established and memories of the recession have faded further. Now, the first reason is that the output gap and the margin of spare capacity in the economy are notoriously difficult to measure in real time. And hence, there is great uncertainty around the measurement and forecasting of these variables, particularly in the wake of a major recession. Some economists have warned about this problem for some time. And it's significant that the margin of spare capacity that we currently observe in firms and in the labor market appears much less than we might have expected following a major recession. Within the labor market, the current unemployment rate is still below 8%, whereas in the aftermath of the 80s and 90s recession, it went over 10%. And uh, even though there are worries about unemployment, it should gradually drop back as the recovery proceeds. The response of companies in terms of retaining employees through this recession is perhaps not unexpected in the knowledge economy we currently inhabit. inhabit. The employees of a business represent a stock of experience and skills which is needed to underpin future profits and growth. And in the recession, we saw many companies trying to minimize layoffs and making more flexible use of their labor resources and by agreeing or imposing wage freezes or low pay increases. But now the economy is recovering. We're seeing these downward pressures on pay beginning to unwind in the private sector. Pay settlements are now moving up again with headline inflation expected to remain high throughout this year. And in a recent survey conducted by the Bank of England agents around the country, expected inflation is cited as the biggest single upward pressure on pay settlements at present. And this data from the income data services uh, surveys of pay settlements shows how this is coming through in the most recent settlements. This is uh, settlements that they have detected over the last month or so the lowest of which is uh, over 2% and the highest of which is over 5%. Their provisional average estimate of pay settlements for January is 2.6%, not far short of the average of just over 3%, which income data services um, measured as the average of pay settlements in the 2000s before the recession. It's also the case that uh, in manufacturing industry, regular pay growth, as measured by the Office for National Statistics, has already bounced back to its pre-recession level, or it did until perhaps the very recent figures we, um, we, we have got in for November and December, but those are provisional, so we have to be careful about those. But if companies have retained labor resources rather than laying off workers, we might expect that to show, off, show up in a large margin of spare capacity within businesses. But that doesn't appear to be the case either. Um, in my earlier career, I worked for the CBI, and I followed the CBI Industrial Trends Survey very closely. Their January survey showed that the number of firms working below capacity in manufacturing is roughly bang on line with its historical average. There's more evidence in the services sector that companies may be uh, working below capacity, but if you look at these scores from the Bank of England's agents' reports to the Monetary Policy Committee on uh, capacity utilisation relative to normal, even in the services sector, um, there's not a very considerable margin 
of spare capacity. This may be partly because the services sector appeared to be working considerably above capacity in the period of growth prior to the recession, and some easing of the pressure of the demand during the recession has reflected a return to a more normal state of affairs. Having said all this, there is still a bit of a puzzle about the level of capacity in the economy, um, and that's discussed in some detail in the uh, bank's inflation report. But in these circumstances, I would rather put more weight on the business surveys than some of uh, the other measures people are looking at, like productivity data that maybe suggest there is more scope for productivity to catch up. The interpretation of recent movements in productivity is also sensitive to the estimate of trend productivity growth, which is notoriously difficult to make in real time. So it's very difficult to measure the amount of spare capacity, and a lot of the measures that we can now observe suggest that the margin of spare capacity in the economy um, is not great. But a second reason why the domestic output gap model has failed to explain UK inflation recently is it embodies an oversimplistic view of demand influences on inflation. Now, I'm a strong believer in the view that the demand climate um, has an important bearing on inflation. But the output gap view of the world focuses on the level of demand relative to some notional capacity level in the domestic economy. And this is only one dimension of the demand picture. In their pricing decisions, businesses will not just be looking at the level of demand, but also at its actual and expected growth rate. And as this chart shows, the growth of domestic demand in the UK economy has bounced back strongly, particularly in nominal terms, where it's up to nearly 7%. And this rebound in the growth of demand in money in real terms will have made it easier for companies to pass through price increases. Looking ahead, though we may see some moderation in demand growth as higher VAT affects consumer spending and public spending restraint kicks in, stronger demand growth over the past year can at least help to account for the recent tendency of inflation to run above target. A third factor which could cause the output gap model to perform badly as a predictor of inflation is a change in the perceptions of business about the pricing climate. And the pricing climate which businesses have faced in the recent recession and during the early phases of the recovery has been very different from their experience of the two previous recessions. And policymakers have sent very different signals to the private sector about price setting. Monetary policy through this recession, by and large, has been highly stimulatory to ward off a sharp decline in demand and potential deflationary pressures. Whereas in the previous recessions, demand, uh, monetary policy was kept tight to bear down on inflation. In this environment, monetary policy was set to accommodate upward price and cost pressures to counter deflation. And this has been very effectively achieved. And the relatively high pass-through expected from the recent VAT increase can be seen as an example of this phenomenon. The explicit and implicit signals from UK monetary policy have therefore been operating in the opposite direction to the impact of the output gap, which wasn't the case in previous recessions. Businesses appear to have taken a stronger signal from the stimulatory policy and its impact on demand growth and looked through what they might have reasonably have expected to be a temporary shortfall in demand. And the danger of this is, of course, that businesses come to expect higher inflation on an ongoing basis, and the higher rate of inflation becomes deeply ingrained. And there are some worrying signs that this may be indeed happening. In my last speech in January to the European Policy Forum, I drew attention to the leap in the CBI survey measure of price expectations, the biggest single jump in a single survey uh, of manufacturing since 1968 in that price expectation series. Those of you with long memories will remember that that followed the 1967 devaluation. But however, a more no ominous indicator, perhaps, is the rate of inflation in the services sector. As this chart shows, services inflation measured by the CPI has recently been running at around 4% and picked up to 4.1% in January, having dipped down to about 2.5% in the aftermath of the recession and a VAT cut in 2009, it's back above its average level in the five years prior to the recession, which was about 3.5%. Now, in the early to mid-2000s, as this chart shows, high services inflation was offset by global disinflation in goods prices, which were flat or falling. 
but we now face the prospect of a much more inflationary climate in the goods sector, driven by strong demand in the global economy and rising oil and commodity prices. And the fact that services inflation continues to be relatively strong despite the impact of the recession is perhaps an indication that companies perceive a benign pricing climate in the domestic market and highlights the risk that pr price expectations in the business sector are not currently consistent with the 2% inflation target. So to recap what I've said so far, I've highlighted three reasons why the output gap view um, that spare capacity will bear down on inflation might not have operated recently. The limited margin of spare capacity in the economy and the difficulty in measuring it, the rebound in domestic demand growth, and a change in the pricing climate due to the accommodation of price and cost increases to ward off fears of deflation. These are not necessarily short-term or one-off influences and may well influence the scope for inflation to fall back over the medium term. But probably the most important reason why the simple output gap model of inflation has not been operating as predicted recently is the influence of the international economy on UK inflation. And that's the fourth uh, reason why I think this simple output gap of the world hasn't operated. And in the transmission of global inflationary pressures to the UK economy, changes in the sterling exchange rate play a key role. As the inflation report makes clear, the upward pressure of demand from the global economy and its impact on the price of oil, other commodities, and other globally traded manufactured goods has been a major influence on UK inflation over the past year. But this should not really be a surprise, as it's not a new phenomenon. I've argued in speeches and articles throughout my time on the MPC that the UK is a very international economy and global influences are a major issue for the course of demand and inflation in the UK economy. Just to quote from what I said in my speech last month, the UK economy is sufficiently open to international influences that our inflation outlook can never be purely a product of domestic factors. Properly taking into account the influence of the international economy is the key to the art of successful management of UK monetary policy. And I can't resist putting up this slide again, which I used um, last month, but I also set out in a speech back in 2007 when we were also seeing upward pressures on inflation from the global economy, which highlights the various ways in which the global economy affects the inflation climate and then the various instruments um, which are available or the various influences or channels which are available for monetary policy uh, to, to counteract those. And uh, I, I don't have time now to go through this in, in, in detail, but to observe that from the mid-1990s until the mid-2000s, these global influences were generally in a disinflationary direction and allowed the MPC, as I commented earlier, to allow services inflation and domestic pressures to run at the higher level I drew attention to earlier without threatening the inflation target. Since the mid-2000s, global prices have been rising sharply, particularly in oil and commodity markets, and global growth has been relatively strong. We enjoyed a, a brief respite from high UK inflation in the period of weak global demand in 2009 in the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis, and that did help to bring down UK inflation at that time. But now normal business is resumed, the oil price is back over $100 a barrel, UK import prices are once again rising sharply, manufacturing input prices are rising at double digit levels, and factory gate prices um, are rising at 4 to 5% per annum. As the latest inflation report makes clear, the MPC has conditioned its forecasts on the basis that this surge in global inflation will quickly subside. This seems to me most unlikely. A key driver behind the upward pressure on prices in global markets has been strong global economic growth, particularly driven by Asia and other emerging markets. About six months ago, there were concerns that global growth may have been faltering, with the US economy in a soft patch and some evidence of slowing in Asia. But more recent indicators have been much more positive. Forecasts of future global growth are now being revised up again with projections of US economic growth in particular being uprated. Now we'll hear more about this from Jim O'Neill later, um, but just to draw attention to the fact that the latest IMF forecasts are for 2012 to continue in a period of growth 
um, as strong as we saw in the mid-2000s. And that was, as I noted before, a period of continued upward pressure uh, in terms of inflation in the global economy. Now, you'll have seen from my earlier slide that the first line of defence for the UK against global inflationary pressures is the value of the pound. The value of sterling can help dampen the impact of imported inflation as the imp uh, experience of the Bundesbank in combating the impact of global inflation in the mid-70s showed. A relatively strong or an appreciating currency can provide a windbreak against an inflationary gale blowing in from the world economy. And we saw, see some economies um, beginning to uh, try to engineer an appreciation of the external value of their currencies in this climate for this reason, for example, in Singapore. Now, the UK is not a, such a small and open economy as Singapore, but we are a much more open economy than the United States or the euro area. And as such, the external value of the pound should have a significant weighting in our assessment of monetary conditions. Now, instead of sterling operating as a windbreak for inflationary pressures, the decline in the external value of, of the pound has reinforced the upward pressure on inflation from global price influences over the past few years. As this chart shows, the sterling effective exchange rate has dropped by around a quarter in terms of its value against the trade-weighted basket of currencies. This is a much bigger fall in the external value of the pound than we saw in the early 90s. And that reduction in the value of sterling was reversed after about around five years when we saw the appreciation in 96, 97. Now this next chart shows the recent move in the light blue line against uh, previous episodes of sterling depreciation we've seen over the past 50 years. It shows that the fall in sterling since 2007 is the biggest decline over a two to three year period than we've seen over the past 50 years. Indeed, the recent fall in the external value of the pound between 2007 and 2009 is probably the largest depreciation we have experienced in a relatively short period over the past two centuries, with the exception of the departure from the gold standard in the early 1930s, which saw a, a, a slightly bigger move in the effective exchange rate, but not one actually that's not, that is that dissimilar from the experience we've seen over the last two to three years. Now, some part of this decline is obviously helpful in terms of rebalancing the economy by providing manufacturers and other businesses trading on international markets with a competitive advantage. But in the wake of the inflationary pressures we're currently experiencing from the global economy, there must be a concern that we've let the pound fall much further than this rebalancing requires. In the 1990s rebalancing, when inflation was kept successfully in check as the economy rebalanced, the adjustment in the exchange rate was around 15%, not 25%. As you can see, when the pound corrected in the mid-1980s from its petrocurrency status, the adjustment was much smaller than we've seen since 2007. Indeed, it's perhaps a worry that the only broadly comparable decline in the pound we've seen over half a decade or so since the 1960s was in the period 1972 to 77 which, as you will know, was associated with a period of very poor UK inflation performance. Now, while we're very long way from the double-digit inflation rates of that period, the weakness of sterling may still help to reinforce the cycle of rising inflation as it did in the mid-70s. The UK is not sufficiently small and open to overseas trade that we need to make the exchange rate the sole anchor of our monetary policy. That approach didn't work well in the late 80s and early 90s, and we have, in general, done a much better job of managing the UK economy under our current inflation target regime. But nor can we treat the movement in the exchange rate as a factor which is independent of UK monetary policy. It's one of the key channels through which monetary policy can affect the course of the economy and our inflation rate. The pound fell sharply in 2008-2009 when the predominant worry was the negative impact of weak global demand and global deflation in the UK economy. In these circumstances, there was little reason to worry about the inflationary consequences of the decline in the pound. But the persistence of such a large depreciation and the change in the global climate has significantly shifted the balance of risks. We now find ourselves in a different world, one of relatively strong global demand and global inflationary pressures. 
And in my view, these upward pressures on global demand and prices are not about to abate quickly and are one of the key reasons why I would expect UK inflation in the medium term to be higher than the latest inflation report. Now, as I have argued since last summer, we face a very different balance of risk to inflation in the medium term from the one we faced in the spring and summer of 2009. When interest rates were cut to a half a percent and the MPC injected 200 billion pounds of money into the economy through quantitative easing. Last July, in a speech, I borrowed a film and album title from Led Zeppelin to highlight my message. For Led Zeppelin, the song remains the same, whether they were playing around the world in the mid-70s or when they were reforming in the O2 arena just over three years ago. But last summer, I argued that the monetary policy song should not remain the same if the global and domestic economy were playing a different tune. Now, another classic album for, for you rock music aficionados from that golden era of rock music and economic turmoil, I have to say, is Selling England by the Pound, released in 1973. I should have put a, a picture of the album, type, uh, album cover up for you by Genesis. I think if we're to avoid selling England by the pound in the sphere of monetary policy, we need to ensure that a weak or declining currency is not aggravating imported price pressures and destabilizing the path of inflation over the medium term. We could be relaxed about that risk when global demand was so weak in late 2008 and 2009, but we can't afford to be so relaxed now against the background of strong and sustained global inflationary pressure particularly given the historically large recent declines in sterling. The value of the pound on the foreign exchanges therefore needs to be one of the key areas of focus for the MPC as we seek to steer ourselves out of the current phase of high inflation. And one of the benefits which we might see from a policy of raising interest rates is a modest appreciation of sterling, which should mitigate the impact of global inflationary pressures in the short term and help steer inflation back to target over the medium term. By raising interest rates sooner rather than later to help offset global inflationary pressures, the MPC can help reassure the financial markets and the great British public that we remain true to our inflation target remit and are not intent on selling England by the pound. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew. I'll throw it open to questions in a minute. Um, I personally very much welcome the use of uh, musical metaphors, given that I'm not particularly a cricket fan, which is what normally peppers Bank of England speeches. Uh, if you look at the, um, the pound over the past few days, one conclusion you could draw is that, the, uh, to borrow another musical metaphor, the markets are a bit dazed and confused by the messages coming out of the Bank of England uh, at the moment. Do you recognize that there is a, a somewhat clouded picture uh, coming out first from the governor's uh, letter on Tuesday and then the inflation report uh, tomorrow, which led to gyrations in the markets as people tried to discern what the bank's uh, attitude is? Well, I think we can certainly conclude from um, the movements in the pound that monetary policy can have quite a significant effect on the perceptions in the foreign exchange markets. In a sense, that is why uh, the pound is moving in relation to these signals. Um, I think we'll get a a complete picture of the view on the Monetary Policy Committee on um, when the minutes come out, uh, which is um, next week. But um, I think the Governor made clear that there are differences of view on the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, I'm, I'm not in the, the business of commenting on the views of, of, of others, uh, but I think I've made my position um, very clear, and I was very pleased to see that Martin Weald joined the um, the. Uh, position of supporting a rate rise uh, in the, at the January meeting. And as I've uh, gone through the period in which I've argued this, I feel that the arguments both in terms of the growth econ of the economy, particularly the growth of the global economy, and inflation have moved in that direction. One of the things that the governor said uh, yesterday was that uh, you know, a small move in rates would be a futile uh, gesture, uh, referring to beyond the fringe, I think was, his, uh, um, was, was the metaphor he used, where a general says, uh, let's uh, make a small futile gesture to raise the whole tone of the wall. Um, it, are you basically, is your argument therefore that we actually need quite serious moves in interest rates rather than a token uh, symbolic move? Uh, yes, I, might, I think if you listen to my argument today and the speeches that I made um, throughout the second half of last year, 
I wasn't arguing for a change in monetary policy for a token reason. Uh, I was arguing earlier on that rate rises would need to be, uh, it would be desirable for them to be gradual. Um, I think obviously the longer um, this uh, overrun in inflation persists, um, I think the more difficult that uh, becomes for the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, and I think the risk, I've, I think as I've made clear, the risk of leaving uh, interest rate rises longer is that they may have to be more abrupt. And I would worry about that for uh, the jolt to confidence and the recovery that might, that might come about. Great. Let me um, throw it open to questions. If you could say uh, your name and where you uh, come from when, when the mic comes to you. Um, welcome all questions uh, to Andrew now on his speech and uh, on the broader monetary policy backdrop. <laughs> yes, sorry. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I must say, I found a lot of what Andrew said quite persuasive, which, since I'm in completely the opposite camp, is interesting in itself. Um, what I wanted to ask Andrew was um, what evidence would persuade him that he was wrong? Um, I think if we. If we saw a serious faltering in the global economy, I think you will see that my argument is quite internationalist. I'll be very interested to hear what Jim's going to say and you're going to say about the international economy. Um, I think throughout this, I've said that uh, I see the UK as uh, very heavily influenced by the international economy, both in terms of growth and inflation. Um, if we saw a really serious setback to global recovery prospects, I think that would, uh, that would be uh, a reason for, for changing... My view. I don't think that, I mean, it's always a risk, but I don't think that's anything like the central forecast at the moment. As I said, the IMF forecasts are for pretty uh, strong global growth, and indeed the, the Bank of England's central forecasts are for strong global growth. I think um, the, the point I drew attention to in my speech about the, the Bank of England's inflation report forecast is that they expect the price increases that we're seeing on global markets to subside pretty quickly, and I'm much more cautious about that. Questions, please. Uh, back to Andrew. Um, the uh, Japanese are too quickly, but suffered as a consequence. Uh, suffered as a consequence. Um, given the observation by Lord Young that we've never had it so good and that people continue to spend their excess income rather than save it um, because of low interest rates, um, are you sure that rising interest rates won't tip us over the other side of the uh, debate? Well, I think we need to be careful about using, treating monetary policy as if it's an on-off switch um, and somehow there's the current stance of monetary policy or there's some you know, much tighter monetary policy in the future. There are degrees to which monetary policy can be tightened. And as I said, the argument that I've been making um, has been generally for a gradual tightening of monetary policy. However, the longer that is delayed, that, that there are risks that that may not... Uh, be such a strong option in the future. But um, certainly, uh, in terms of any tightening of policy, the MPC always, as, as Mervyn King emphasised yesterday, judges its policy response on a month-by-month -month basis. Um, and uh, that would inevitably uh, be the case and, and would be desirably to, desirable to be the case over um, a period in which the MPC was money raising uh, interest rates. The point that I've been making fairly consistently is that the monetary policy settings that we put in place in uh, the summer of 2009 were for a different world from the one that we now inhabit. They were to ward off deflation and deepening recession. And so we need some adjustment in monetary policy. We don't necessarily go back to the sort of levels of interest rates we were, we were at before the recession. We need some adjustment in monetary policy. And the longer we need, leave that adjustment, the more we're exposed to these inflationary pressures um, and the more abrupt, potentially, a monetary adjustment could be in the future. We're running on a little bit. Time for one more question, please. Hello, I'm Noel Dresner. Would you be kind enough to explain what your perception of the futures of two years to three years down the road would be if the interest rate increases your um, arguing for actually take place, what it's going to do to the housing market, consumer spending, and so forth? Well, I think the, um, the view that I'm set setting out is conditional, as I made clear in my answer to Roger, that uh, 
The world economy will continue to grow reasonably healthily. There are structural reasons for that to do with the growth in Asia and emerging markets. And also, some of the other markets hit by the recession have actually bounced back quite well. If you look at Germany, it's one of our biggest export markets. The economy is doing well. Even the US is now looking a bit, a bit stronger. Um, if that global uh, recovery continues, that provides quite a strong impetus for UK recovery against which we need to see these factors uh, affecting consumer spending and, and public spending. Uh, there will be some drag on consumer spending from uh, the VAT rise that's just come in, um, though that may uh, turn out to be short-lived as consumers adjust to that VAT rise uh, relatively quickly. But we've seen in uh, previous recoveries where there's been fiscal tightening, such as the mid-1990s, consumer spending and investment can still grow albeit perhaps not as, as strong rates as, as we've seen on some episodes in the past. And I would be looking for private sector demand to be the main engine of growth uh, in the UK economy alongside uh, global growth. Um, I don't think we should expect spectacular growth rates, um, but if we look back, actually, the UK economy did bounce back in 2010, notwithstanding the Q4 growth figure, slightly stronger than most people were expecting. Um, and that's perhaps an indication that when the global growth environment is healthy, uh, that does provide momentum to growth in the UK. Great. I'm afraid we have to leave it there and move on to uh, Roger. Uh, Roger Bootle is Managing Director of uh, Capital Economics, Economic Advisor to the Accountancy uh, Deloitte, and former Chief Economist of HSBC, author of many books uh, on uh, economics, including most recently uh, The Trouble with Markets, but uh, back in 1996, uh, the famous book The Death of Inflation, which uh, correctly anticipated many aspects uh, of what followed the Great Stability, but which now feels a very a long time ago. Uh, Roger's going to talk to us about uh, the EU outlook for the Eurozone. Well, thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to speak at these IEA conferences. And uh, uh, this year, a particular pleasure in Andrew Sentence's terms to be both a warm-up act for Jim O'Neill and a cool-down act for Andrew Sentence. Uh, some of us need, I think, a bit of cooling down. Um, well, I've been asked to talk about the outlook for economic growth in the Eurozone. I'm not actually going to go through all the usual boring stuff about, you know, consumption's going to do this and government spending's going to do that and we're going to end up at, you know, whatever it might be, 1 1.8, 1 1.7. Rather, what I'm going to do is to concentrate on what I think are three serious structural problems which are going to hold back growth in the Eurozone, and then I'm going to conclude with a few longer-term remarks. But I want to start by putting all this into perspective, uh, if I can get the slide thing to operate, there we are, uh, by showing you, I guess, what you in broad terms already know, but it's worth, I think, reminding ourselves about the relative size of different countries in the Eurozone. Of course, a lot of the countries that um, have been in the news very prominently recently are tiddlers, as you see there on the left, and that uh, description, I think, applies to Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and a few other countries. Germany is, of course, the largest economy in the Eurozone, but let's not get it out of perspective. I think a lot of people do get it out of perspective and think that its size is absolutely overwhelming. It's not, actually. It's somewhat less than a third of Eurozone GDP and a combination of Spain and Italy, never mind Spain and France, or Italy and France, would just about, Spain and Italy just about get to the German size, and the that group of vulnerable countries, I have to be careful of the um, PC police on this, I was going to refer to the pigs, but whenever I use that word, I get people coming down on me like a ton of bricks, I don't know, the garlic belt plus Ireland or whatever, that grouping amounts to a few percentage points larger than Germany as a share of uh, Eurozone GDP. Now, what are these three problems that I said I was going to talk about? Well, uh, they are, briefly, the public finances, competitiveness, and what I'll briefly refer to as the German problem. More about that in a moment. The public finances. Government debt as a share of GDP. This is how it stacks up. There are, of course, a few ultra-virtuous members of the Eurozone. Uh, Luxembourg there on the far left, but on the whole, you know the story. It's one of... Um, profligacy and considerable danger and threat for the future, with Greece there on the far right at uh, enormous levels of debt compared to GDP. Now, those of you who are quite sharp-eyed may notice that um, the UK appears on this chart as well. 
Let me assure you that's not because I haven't noticed that we're not in it, nor is it a forecast that we might soon join it, and still less is it the belated admission by our bootle that we should join it. Uh, it's there for comparison purposes only. <clears throat> now, uh, on the subject of comparison, let me remind you that the reference value for the debt-to-GDP ratio in the Maastricht Treaty was 60% of GDP, and under Gordon Brown's famous golden rule, uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio in the UK was supposed to be 40%. So looking at these numbers, you can see some pretty horrific picture. It's interesting that although Germany and France don't figure very large in discussions of the alarming level of government debt, actually both those countries are themselves pretty high. When it comes to uh, government deficits, I can't usefully draw an honest picture, including Ireland. I've foreshortened it, as you can see, because if I put Ireland on the same scale, you wouldn't see any picture for the other countries uh, at all. It would all be squashed into insignificance. But you're talking here about some horrendous levels of the government deficit. So what are the implications of all this? Well, there are a number of senses in which I think this fiscal position is going to hold demand back. First of all, there's fiscal tightening, which is going to happen in a number of these countries. Secondly, there's the uh, high level of market interest rates, long-term bond rates. Thirdly, there's the effect on confidence. And lastly, there's the danger of default, which will have implications for the banking system as well as confidence and a few other variables. Now, with regard to the size of fiscal tightening, this varies, of course, a lot from country to country, but this is what the uh, European Commission has laid out as the required scale of fiscal tightening in these different countries. And as far as Greece is concerned there on the far right, you're talking about something uh, of the order of 10% of GDP. This is absolutely enormous, and it knocks our own fiscal tightening into a cocked hat. This is bound to have a significant impact, I think, on the growth of demand in these countries. As far as pressure on markets are concerned, um, let me give you a relative scale of these different countries' requirements from the markets. I'm going to concentrate in my remarks on that grouping. I know garlic belt peripheral economies, call them what you will. Um, and as you can see, reflecting what I said at the beginning, a lot of these countries that uh, figure prominently in the discussion are in fact quite small. Portugal, Ireland, Greece, small. And I put in there for comparison another country which has recently come into the spotlight, namely Belgium. And Belgium's a bit bigger than a tiddler, but obviously she's not a big country. <clears throat> but I think the focus on Belgium is very interesting because although the debt numbers for Belgium are horrific, get debt to GDP uh, numbers, many of Belgium's other economic statistics aren't actually that concerning. She's got significant overseas assets, for instance. She's not a you know, huge current account deficit country like some of these others. Why the markets have started to focus on Belgium is primarily political. That's to say, it's a country without a government, and indeed, it might soon not even be a country. And when you think about it, that's pretty fundamental. And given all that, the country that I find most interesting in this regard is actually the one to the far right, namely Italy, which is, of course, far and away the largest uh, in terms of its economic size and also the requirement from the markets for financing of government debt. It's the political danger in Italy strikes me as one of the serious things that the market is not yet fully appreciating. After all, what would happen if Berlusconi were to go the way of all flesh? I, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. He's already <laughs> gone the way of all flesh. But if we were to have a um, <coughs> serious political crisis in Italy, uh, again, uh, how would one imagine the Italian situation going forward? I think this is an is a aspect of the crisis that is underappreciated in the markets. And while we're on the subject of the markets, uh, this is what the position looks like with regard to government bond yields, 10-year government bond yields. And I've marked on here um, those five peripheral economies. They've all moved up significantly, but of course bond yields have moved up in other countries as well, not in the Eurozone. The figures for Greece are quite extraordinary. I've marked on there uh, the support package for Greece. It happened um, in May of last year, and you can see the current yields in the markets aren't very different from the ones at the crisis peak. I think it's quite interesting to look at what's happened in Ireland, where the yields are actually much, much higher. Portugal, too, they've gone up a lot, and Spain as well. So the 
crisis in the markets, the loss of confidence in the markets, is still very much there. And my own view is that the public finances in Greece in particular, and maybe some other countries, are so perilous that I cannot see how a default can be avoided. Uh, and in which case, uh, at some stage or other, uh, the European financial system is going to cope with some serious blows to uh, uh, its balance sheet. OK, Greece is small, but if one country goes... I think we'll see anxiety by a number of others as well. So for all those reasons that I've given, I think this perilous fiscal position is going to have quite a restraining impact uh, on the Eurozone, the economies of the Eurozone, for a number of years. And the second problem I said I would talk about was competitiveness. And this is how it looks. Unit labour costs, again, these five peripheral countries, as against Germany since the formation of the Euro in 1999. Uh, I have to say, in Germany, uh, the business sector has really been spectacularly successful at keeping down labour costs. Uh, they, I think, just, uh, justifiably have earned the Andrew Sentence Award for anti-inflationary behaviour. Um, spectacularly good performance, ringing productivity gains, keeping down uh, wage increases, and the net result is unit labour costs really very well behaved indeed. Now, by contrast, in the peripheral economies, they've carried on doing what they always used to do, that's to say, inflating away. Not quite as fast as they did before, but nevertheless inflating considerably. Now, some of these countries, you could argue, started with fairly competitive exchange rates to start with when they joined the euro, although their previous history of unit labour cost growth probably didn't put them in an ultra-competitive position. Now, overall, this is, I think, a worrying development, and it means that for most, if not all, of these countries on the periphery, they're facing a significant problem of uncompetitiveness within the eurozone, and therefore, given the euro's external exchange value, also uh, outside the eurozone too. And just to ram home the point that uh, these unit labour cost figures aren't just sort of pie in the sky... Um, let's look at the current account position of these different countries. You've got, this is a single monetary union, of course, and it's quite extraordinary, I think, to see the degree of divergence between the core members and the peripheral countries. These figures, like all the ones I'm showing, or nearly all of them, are shown as a proportion of GDP, so you can make comparisons between the different countries. Uh, Netherlands and Germany, they're on the left, running huge surpluses, uh, and... On the right, you've got Portugal and Greece running deficits of the order of 10%, 10% of GDP. I mean, these are absolutely horrific numbers. And so the result of all this, I think, is that it, it's very difficult to see how these countries can pull themselves up out of the mess that they're in, in a way that, with regard to the UK, uh, there's, I think, a fair old chance that the fall of the pound that Andrew's sentence referred to so clearly may, in the, in the end, bring us some significant competitive advantage and export growth being pretty good. It's difficult to see, I think, over a run of years that that's going to be uh, in the offing for these peripheral countries. Now, the third problem I said I'd talk about is what I briefly referred to as the German problem. Now, I'm not going to hark back to various other German problems that historians have talked about in the past. I'm talking about something purely economic, uh, and it is quite simply the tendency for domestic demand in Germany not to grow very fast. Now, this chart shows the history, again, since the formation of the euro in 1999, of the growth of exports, consumption, and government spending. Consumption and government spending are the... Uh, lines on the left at uh, the bottom of the chart and exports the line at the top of the chart. Now, there have been some signs recently, I must admit, that Germany is changing a bit and there are be the beginnings of signs of growth of reasonable uh, growth of, dom of domestic demand, including consumer spending. But overall, the picture has been one very much of the economy being driven by exports. And I can put that into closer perspective by comparing real consumer spending in Germany, the UK and the US. Again, since the beginning uh, of the euro in 1999, the green and blue lines at the top that are racing away are, of course, the US and the UK. It's very difficult to keep an Anglo-Saxon consumer down. Uh, it's pretty easy, though, to keep them down in Germany when they don't seem to be that keen on spending. Now, <clears throat> it's widely believed that this is due to some innate Teutonic tendency to want to save a lot of uh, consumer income. And there is, I think, something in that. 
but it's often overdone. This is the history of the German personal savings ratio over the last few years. It has moved up, as you can see, although not spectacularly over the last three or four years. And the long-term tendency has been actually uh, for German saving in the past to be a lot higher. I think the really interesting thing about Germany over the last couple of years, and this to a large extent mirrors what's happened in China, uh, partially bearing out Martin Wolf of the FT's notion of Germany, this joint identity between China and Germany. The really interesting thing, I think, is what's happened to the share of national income. Here we've got labour share as the blue line and the profit share as the red line. What's happened in Germany is that a larger share of national income has gone to company profits. Again, uh, part of what I was saying earlier on about German business having played a blinder, they've also played a blinder in keeping a substantial amount of the benefit of all this to themselves. Profit share gone up, labour share gone down. So it's not only that the Germans are saving a great deal of their income, slightly more than before, it's also that their incomes have not been growing very fast despite uh, reasonable German, recent German GDP growth. Now, I've referred to this as the German problem. Why is it a problem? Well, it's a problem more for the rest of the Eurozone than it is for Germany, but it means that it's actually quite difficult for other countries in the Eurozone to post uh, rapid rates of growth when the leading economy uh, in the system is not prone to decent growth of domestic demand. Now, OK, that could change. I say there have been some a few encouraging signs recently, but on the balance of history... I'm not convinced. I think we will probably continue to see the growth of German consumption fairly low. And if that is so, uh, it's going to cause problems for the rest of the Eurozone. OK, so given all that, what is the growth outlook over the next couple of years? Uh, well, first of all, no surprises, I suppose, a big difference within the Eurozone. As I said earlier on, Germany does seem to be doing extremely well at the moment, and some of the others, including some tiddlers, aren't doing badly. But at the other end of the spectrum, we've got some simply dreadful, dreadful figures for uh, the peripheral economies, with Greece probably contracting again by about 4% of GDP, Portugal and Spain not by as much as, as that, but nevertheless contracting again, and Italy, as it usually does, struggling on not growing very much at all. But overall, the picture looks grim. And I suspect that growth this year will be weaker than growth last year in the Eurozone, maybe down to around about 1% compared to 1.7% uh, last year. And moving on to 2012, I think a, an outcome not that different, very different between different members of the Eurozone, but in the context of what I've talked about uh, as being the problems and difficulties, no, well, I think not much chance of a significant acceleration, and indeed, on our figures, even a deceleration of growth. Now, I said at the beginning that as well as talking about these problems, structural problems, and saying something about the immediate outlook, I would conclude by saying a few words about the longer-term outlook, and that's what I'd now like to do. I mean, is there a sense in which the Eurozone is doomed to grow at very low rates for the foreseeable future? Uh, I think the answer is most definitely no. Uh, there is a distinct possibility that things could change, such that uh, Eurozone growth could be a lot higher than the Eurozone has been used to over the last several years, and higher than I think is likely for the immediate future. What are the problems well, first, I would argue there's a massive problem with regard to the size and role of government in Eurozone economies, interfering too much and in the wrong ways and taxing too heavily, spending too much and taxing too heavily. Secondly, I think there may well be a problem about the euro itself, and I'm not dwelling on that now because, as you may have noticed, if you looked at your programme for today, uh, the session is going to conclude this afternoon with a debate and discussion between myself and Patrick Minford, if indeed it is possible to have a discussion with Patrick <laughs> Minford. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it would be particularly interesting in this regard because I'm not sure that, in fact, our views on the euro differ that much. But, but a second issue where things could drastically change, surely, is a fundamental change in the structure and makeup. Uh, an operation of the euro, which could then release forces that could bring stronger economic growth. And there are two other factors which also could play out differently. The first is the labour market. As you know, um, uh, 
some of Eurozone countries have experienced appallingly high levels of unemployment. That country racing away at the top there is Spain. Uh, now, these figures, like many official stats, have got to be taken with a pinch of salt because we know that the hidden economy, or call it what you will, is, mu is pretty high in Spain. I don't think that 20% odd of the workforce are genuinely unemployed in Spain. But nevertheless, uh, the performance is pretty grim. Now, by contrast, in Germany, as you can just about make out there at the bottom, there's been a very uh, welcome and surpri surprisingly good performance by the labour market, uh, which has seen German unemployment fall quite considerably. And this is partly due to the labour market reforms that were brought in under the previous government. They're actually paying dividends, I think. Now, so one of the things which could transform the Eurozone outlook in the medium term is, I think, serious economic reform of the labour market. Uh, there is the potential, if we were to see that, for, I think, some much better outturns from the Eurozone economy than I'm forecasting for the immediate future. And the second longer-term uh, factor I want to allude to, uh, it's going to be actually fairly downbeat, but it could change, uh, is the level of population and the associated factors to do with that, the rate of growth of the labour force. Now, you'll be, uh, I hope, not surprised and relieved to hear that I'm not about to engage in the business of forecasting populations. I find economic forecasting difficult enough, as many of you no doubt will um, attest. Um, but so these forecasts come from the UN, but I think they're very striking. Population projections going forward, again, I've marked on the US and Japan for comparison. The US is the top line, population set to be racing away. Japan, the bottom line, set to be contracting quite significantly. And then we've got various European countries. Uh, France, quite well placed, actually, uh, in the sense of population continuing to grow for a bit and then stabilising. But in the case of Italy and Germany, you've got some huge prospective falls in the level of population. And this is, I think, a significant factor holding back uh, prospects for economic growth in these countries over the next several years. It's bad for consumption. People tend to save uh, high amounts in this sort of environment. It certainly ain't good for investment uh, as, company, as companies confront uh, a shrinkage in both the workforce and, as it were, the consuming force, the, pot the potential for growth of consumption. This is the sort of environment in which it's difficult for economic growth to thrive. Now, of course, all this could change. And indeed, um, these projections may prove to be radically wrong, principally, I guess, because higher rates of immigration transform the picture. But this is, I think, a significant medium-term problem. It's so significant, indeed, that um, some WAG has suggested that if the Italians carry on like this, by something like the year 2150, they will have died out altogether. You may think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. I'll leave that to you. Um, so this is, I think, a very significant uh, factor uh, affecting the economy. And it may well be there's a big change in this environment with regard to uh, uh, immigration, a number of other factors, which boost confidence and transform the picture. But at the moment, I think this is a significant, a further significant structural negative holding the Eurozone back. So my conclusion is that I think the outlook for growth in the Eurozone is not encouraging at all. I hope very much I'm wrong, because this is one of the reasons why, contrary to Andrew's sentence, I'm actually very cautious about the growth outlook for the UK, precisely because I think this, our biggest market, on our doorstep is not going to grow very much at all. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Roger, for that upbeat uh, conclusion. Um, one, one on the competitiveness uh, side of things, I was fascinated to see at the end of last year that Fiat admitting that it makes as many cars in one Polish factory as it does in all five of its Italian factories. I think that really underlines the point you're making uh, on the competitiveness of, of some of the peripheral, uh, perif if you can call it Ita Italy peripheral, uh, some of the peripheral Eurozone countries. However, we did see, as your, as your chart um, showed, that Germany did sort out its competitiveness problem in quite a serious way. Why are you so much less optimistic about some of the other Eurozone countries and their ability to do the same? Because they're not German. Um, and I think that, as I said, our German business, I think, has played a blinder. Interestingly, um, I think the German government has done a pretty good job, too, under Schroeder. I, th I think it did a pretty sound job of <laughs> undertaking fundamental and difficult reforms, which I mentioned, the labour market, which have paid off. Now, you know, it may be that under the pressure of the crisis that I think the Eurozone continues to be in, that we'll get similar uh, 
changes in other countries, but I'm not optimistic, I have to say. Uh, I mean, Italy, for instance, I mean, it's very, very difficult to get anything uh, significant done on the reform front in Italy. Um, Italian growth has been low for a long time and before the formation of the euro. I'm not optimistic about Greece either, managing to, um, to push these things forward. And in the context of these pretty depressed output numbers, I think it's going to be very difficult for, for governments to actually get political support for you know, really, really tough reforms. So yes, it is possible, and it's possible, therefore, that my pessimism will be proved wrong. I, 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 hope, I hope in many ways that it is, but um, I'm not optimistic. I, mean, I, went, I went to Germany um, towards the end of last year, and there was a sense that there is a, there is a change of mood among German consumers at the moment. They are beginning to spend, especially the IFO retail uh, numbers are absolutely through the roof. Uh, are you potentially slightly underestimating the, uh, the, the, um, the domestic side uh, and the spending side of the German, German economy and, that, and, that, and the ability of that side of the economy to propel the Eurozone forward? Yeah, that would be one of the factors which, were, were it to emerge um, in a big way, could result in much better performance for the Eurozone. And that would be potentially, I think, a very optimistic thing for Britain if we got very strong growth of German consumer spending and that sustaining, being sustained. It would be one of the factors that I think would make me much more optimistic about Britain. Uh, and as you rightly say, at the moment, that's what seems to be happening. But the long-term record with regard to German consumers is quite disappointing. And my own guess would be that if we see, as I think we will see, further financial crises in the Eurozone, I think we'll see a rolling financial crisis over the next couple of years, that will actually hit German consumer confidence and we'll see an end to this rather more buoyant trend that we've seen recently. Okay. Let me um, open it up to questions from uh, the floor again. Please do say where you're, where you're from and, uh, and your name. Please, at the front there. Adrian Belding from Legal and General. Um, Roger, you mentioned that the, the German economy is very dependent on exports. You, you didn't tell us where those exports are going to, but to the extent that at least some of them are going to other Eurozone countries, as those other Eurozone countries have to address their deficits, will they have difficulty affording the German exports? And what is the impact on the German economy of them finding it increasingly difficult to export to other parts of, of Europe? Yeah, um, well, they're going everywhere. I mean, one of uh, Germany obviously has a very high proportion of its exports going to other Eurozone members, but it's been quite striking that Germany has done very well as a result of the growth of the East Asian economies. She's got a pretty reasonable share of the Chinese market in contrast to the UK, which has got a very low share. And I think that's largely to do quite simply with the sort of stuff that Germany produces rather than the sort of stuff that the UK produces. Um, but you rightly allude to um, one of the threats to the growth of German exports within the Eurozone. And if I'm right in thinking that the fiscal stringency and the continuing crisis in the European periphery is going to restrict the growth of demand in those countries, then it's also going to restrict the growth of demand for German exports to those countries. Now, you know, admittedly, if the rest of the world is racing away, if East Asia continues to grow very strongly, and if the United States grows very strongly, we haven't heard about that yet, but I guess we're going to hear about it, then that may be sufficient to give strong German growth uh, of exports for years to come. But I've got my doubts about that scenario, particularly about the US. Yes, uh, Ben Patterson, CJA Consultants. Um, one of the interesting things about the figures on public finance is the lack of correlation between the size of overall debt and such things as the yield gap. If you take the Italy-Spain pair, the yield gap is much the same, whereas Italy has a massive public debt and Spain relatively low. Uh, Belgium huge, again, not much of a yield gap. Uh, aren't there some factors missing here? Is it to do with the maturity of the debt, where it's held and all sorts of things like that? And aren't these figures of overall debt then rather misleading? Well, I don't think they're misleading. I mean, they are, they are what they are, but it's true that uh, in order to get a full picture, you have to look at other factors as well, and there are some marked differences. Now, one of the reasons why the markets have not been particularly alarmed about Italy, despite what I think is a very weak political situation, which going forward could be, I think, quite significant, is that um, a large proportion of Italian government debt is held by Italians. Uh, and that's widely believed to, to, to mean that as it were, the debt is more firmly held. Now, I've never been utterly convinced by this argument, I have to say. I mean, it seems it presupposes that, you know, domestic holders of debt have got some sort of bond of loyalty to their own government, even though it's going down the tubes. But anyway, this is one of the reasons why Italy 
uh, is, is thought to be a better bet than some of the other countries. Um, secondly, and I think this is more important, if you look at the overall trade and indebtedness position of Italy, it's not that bad. That's to say Italy's net international asset position is reasonable. She hasn't been running these huge current account surplus, uh, deficits and running up massive overseas debts. Unfortunately, Spain has. So in Spain, the debt may be relatively low, a fair proportion of it is held outside, and the net international asset position of Spain is extremely weak. She's been running these huge deficits. The other element, which I think is different and quite significant, is the position of the private sector. Now, uh, as you've heard me say, I don't think the Italian economy is um, wonderfully promising for all sorts of reasons, but by and large, it hasn't been through the sort of ridiculous boom that Spain went through, and its financial system, incredibly, seems to be in much better shape. A reason for being worried about Spain, I think, is that she's had this absurd property binge, rather like Ireland, uh, and uh, property prices are still falling, probably got quite a long way still to go. That's obviously affecting the private sector quite severely and potentially can have a major adverse effect on the banking system. So I don't think the figures are misleading, but they are very far from being the whole of the picture. Time for one more question before we move on to Jim. Stunned silence. Okay. Great. OK, let's move on to Jim then. Um, so Jim O'Neill is uh, chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. He moved over from being chief economist of Goldman Sachs uh, towards the end of last year. Apart from um, having a soft spot for Manchester United, he's best known uh, for his uh, coining the BRICS term to describe the uh, fast-growing clutch of economies. And he's going to also be talking to us about the next 11, which I'm not going to attempt to list, but presumably Jim will. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, and thanks to the IEA uh, for inviting me here. I have to say it's, uh, it's like a throwback. It's a nice privilege to be on the same panel as these two guys. I, think, I can't remember the last time I was on a panel with Roger. It must be a good 15 years back, but it's uh, great to, to do so. Uh, I'm actually, I, listening to Andrew and, and uh, giggling away at them both, I thought I'd try and uh, highlight for you uh, the key five things that I'm going to say in the context also of... Uh, some past uh, pop music, uh, but as you'll tell, my, my tastes aren't quite of the same quality standards as Andrew's. Uh, the first one, uh, I, in, in the 60s and 70s when I was uh, in my uh, more reckless days, uh, I was a big fan of the uh, Four Tops. Uh, and my first theme uh, is Wake Me, Shake Me When It's All Over. Uh, I think we are living in a remarkably uh, exciting time in the true world economy. Uh, it's just that most people from the West don't really get it, partly because they're not really prepared to open their minds uh, and watch and experience it. Um, and it's because of uh, these uh, 15 countries, or, and in particular uh, the four BRICs, and one, increasingly, importantly, one or two of the others. Uh, which is really my second theme. Uh, these 15 countries are four and a half billion people. Uh, and it just happens to be the case of most of my life, and therefore most of the people in this room, that they haven't been that important for the world economy. But uh, there has been times in the past when they have, uh, which, amongst other things, makes it pretty likely that there will be a time uh, in the future that they will be again. Uh, and the... In that context, another uh, Four Tops record is called I'm in a Different World, which often seems to be the case when I speak to many people in the UK about what's going on out there. Um, the third uh, record uh, in that context, very similar one actually, I can't even remember the name of the, the band, that Everybody Wants to Rule the World was a rather catchy... Tears for Fears. Tears for fears. Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Um, Eight of these countries, the four BRICS and four of the next 11, are so economically important today, uh, as you may have read somewhat misleadingly in some of our supposedly uh, representative and leading media, uh, I've uh, tried to redefine these countries as not emerging markets. It seems to me rather ludicrous that we're still referring to the likes of China uh, which is taken over from Japan by some notable distance uh, 
as an emerging market in the way that people have done for the 30 years that I've been in this business. It's sort of a bit silly. Uh, and it's true for a lot of them. Um, and the fourth thing in that context, I'll touch on briefly about uh, <coughs> uh, Egypt and the Middle East, because Egypt is one of our next 11 countries. Uh, and then I'm thinking of that, uh, reminded by uh, another brick in the wall. Uh, if I think of uh, the remarkable things that were uh, unfolding by the day, uh, fascinated this morning waking up to see what's going on in Bahrain. Bahrain is a country uh, that I used to travel to frequently in my days at uh, Swiss Bank Corporation and to see the stories of the kind of things going on in there. This, this <clears throat> feels to me like a 1989 Berlin Wall moment uh, and, and, and the amazing things involving the Soviet Union collapsing. Uh, which brings me to the fifth uh, uh, point, is that if I think if people really, uh, as I'll try and show you, look at all these things together, uh, from an investing perspective, it is a good time to be investing in equities. And linked to uh, that kind introduction, uh, my favorite record of all time uh, was actually made by Manchester United, and it was called Stand Up for the Champions. Uh, and with that in mind, let me show you a few pictures. Uh, here, of all, first of all, from a global perspective uh, and the cycle, you've seen pictures from the other two. I'll throw in my two penny worth at the start. Here is my old guys. I uh, have to be both careful, but also can take more liberties. These are the official forecasts of Goldman Sachs Economics Department, which I had the privilege of being the boss of for 15 years, but that's five months ago. And as you can see, well, you probably can't see too clearly at the back. Can you, can you guys see at the back these numbers? Probably not. Yes. Oh better eyesight than I have. Um, we are bullish uh, because of these 15 countries. Uh, we expect growth to be stronger than the IMF uh, for this year and next, uh, and in my opinion, and, and critical to my theme, uh, I think uh, there is growing evidence that the world economy's growth trend is rising. Or as I'm fond of saying to people uh, in this country, there is at least, there are at least half the world's population that do not sit round saying credit crisis before they have their breakfast. Might think that that's the case if you never get out of the UK, but uh, it is not at all the case in many parts of the world. Most of them sit round when they have a little bit of time to think about all of us in the West and say, what is wrong with that miserable bunch? Uh, and at the core of it is uh, the four BRIC countries. Um, and, and here I, I personally take a tiny bit of exception to uh, something that Roger said, and be certainly much more in Andrew's camp. There are, importantly, growing signs that the pace of this is so powerful, uh, it's actually helping lift uh, many of the economies that are struggling in the West from the crisis. And certainly, uh, my own take, as I'll show you on Germany, uh, is that you could almost argue that Germany has become a developed brick in terms of how much it is exporting to these places. Um, to, complete the, uh, to complete the sort of cyclical picture, here's uh, uh, the much currently popular discussed in financial markets, at least, inflation forecasts. Um, fascinating aspects of the post-crisis world we live in that people have to worry about something all the time. So even those people that sort of buy into the idea that maybe the world's doing a bit better economically, if that's true, then we must be on the verge of some kind of rampant inflationary disease. Uh, there is a bit of an inflation issue in some of these big countries, uh, but in uh, our, my old group's forecast, and I sympathize with this, it is almost pending what they do with their policy, and policy is being tightened quite a lot as we speak in these places, probably a temporary problem. <clears throat> but let me get to the, the, the meat of uh, uh, the issue. <clears throat> uh, here is a chart showing you uh, the likely change in the dollar value of GDP uh, in a number of places over the decade ahead. <clears throat> and uh, linked to the, the, the pop tunes I mentioned, you really have to uh, think of a world turned upside down to sort of comprehend the scale of some of the changes that are going on. Um, <clears throat> these numbers are part of our infamous 2050 uh, projections about the whole brick thing, a couple of which I'll refer to in a second. But they're driven by demographics and productivity the further you go out into the future, productivity assumptions. 
Uh, but looking at this decade uh, as a whole and putting it in the context of the true modern world, the growth eight, as uh, I would call them, that is the four BRICs, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and, the, and four of the next 11, Korea, Indonesia, Turkey, and Mexico, their combined dollar GDP this decade is probably going to rise by between four and five times more than the US. Um, so as has been the case of most of my 30 years in this business of looking uh, towards the US for growth leadership, it is no longer true and hasn't been actually for quite a few years. <clears throat> and it's going to become more and more uh, clear as this decade evolves. Three quarters of that uh, comes from the four BRIC countries. Half of it comes from one, China. Uh, and there is quite frankly nothing like the phenomena as China uh, from what I can see in anything like uh, the recent or, or distant past. You have to go back some time. Uh, many people, when they look at this chart and think, well, they're just extrapolating, it's just extrapolating everything that's been going on. But it's not actually the case. Uh, for China to increase by just over $8 trillion, uh, that will require GDP growth of around 8% on average. In the last decade, China has grown by about 10.5%. Uh, but growing by a significant amount as your base gets bigger is quite easy uh, to, to have a big influence. Uh, at the end of last year, we have just found out China was close to $5.9 trillion, overtaking Japan. Five years quicker uh, than my and my team had thought uh, back in 2003. But if China does what the consensus is saying this year, and if it does, as is priced in the forward markets, show a modest rise against the dollar, that will result in another trillion dollars worth of GDP just from China. Uh, or, or as I'm also fond of saying, China will create another Korea uh, just this year, or another half the United Kingdom. Uh, so it's quite incredible. And if you go across, and the reason why I call them the growth eight, uh, of the likely 10 contributors to global GDP growth, Eight of them are from the BRIC and, and 11 countries. And in the context my, uh, for where I look at the whole European issue, from a global economics perspective, it's not a big deal. You know, and when people ask me about Greece and the likelihood of Greek default, my answer is uh, usually rather rudely, lovely place, but who cares? Uh, from a global perspective, Greece does not really matter unless it is going to cause devastating contagion through uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, on the back of that, this is what the share of global GDP would look like uh, by 2020. Uh, the G7, uh, still the biggest group, if we call them a group, uh, just over 40%. Maybe they should make their own pop band and have some purpose in life going forward. Um, the growth rates would be about 35% of GDP. And importantly, in the context of geopolitics, it is quite likely that the collective GDP of the four BRIC countries will become bigger than the US. Although the stuff beyond that about China uh, is still very much, in my judgment, a possibility rather than a definite. Uh, here are the rest of the pictures that make up uh, the infamous 2050 things that we did years ago. Uh, and here is the sort of journey as we go through uh, the next couple of decades, or next four decades. Uh, and I shan't bore you with uh, the magnitude of these things, because the, particularly when you get beyond the next decade, uh, as somebody that's been in the forecasting business for as long as I have, I would put them very much in the possibility camp rather than something that's definitely going to happen. Uh, but to bring it back to uh, one of my uh, uh, themes, here is uh, how I'm trying to think of these places in terms of uh, their current share of GDP again. On the left-hand uh, chart, you have, uh, as a total share of global GDP, 65% uh, so-called developed markets, uh, and the rest is what most, of, most people call emerging markets. Uh, and if you link it to the right-hand chart, where you see the eight countries I'm talking about, uh, in my opinion, all of these countries, because they are 1% of GDP or more, are developing the characteristics uh, of many of the so-called advanced economies in terms of size, uh, 
capability of doing things in their financial markets, and we shouldn't call them emerging markets. I'm not sure if growth markets is the right phrase, because of course it implies that they will always grow, which of course is not going to be the case either. But to call them emerging markets, it seems to me, uh, is not only kind of increasingly disrespectful, it doesn't really make any sense, because these places, as I'll show more of in a second, are driving the world. Here, here, here is another uh, picture of the same sort of thing, but I show you that because interestingly, and thinking again about this Middle Eastern uh, remarkable uh, set of uh, affairs going on, there's a couple of countries just outside that categorization. Uh, and if we see, if this protest goes uh, a positive way, as opposed to quite obviously possibly a very negative way, uh, and we get some reforms and parts of the Middle Eastern countries start trying to enter the same universe as the rest of us, uh, then some of these countries might appear on the scene more than people realize as well. Um, and and let, me, let me dwell on that a little bit more with this chart. Uh, in order to uh, monitor all of these things, uh, because they are very strange and different places and very confusing and you can't look at them in the same way perhaps you could have done uh, countries more familiar to us all, uh, many years ago, we developed something we call a growth environment score, which is what you can see here. And it's an index that goes from 0 to 10 uh, that includes 13 different variables that are relevant for productivity and sustainable growth. The higher the score, uh, the better they are doing. And let me quickly point out uh, four uh, key things from these pictures. Uh, the first of which is contrary to the uh, email I get almost on the hour, by the hour, every day. Uh, Russia is not uh, the weakest of these four countries on all the things that are relevant for sustainable growth and productivity. India is. So when I get an email asking me when am I going to drop the R in brick, which I literally do get virtually every hour, I say uh, sometimes if it's somebody I, I know well, I'll answer them back and say, well, only if you allow me to drop the I for India too. Uh, the all four of the BRIC countries have to do quite a lot more to get to where their long-term potential is. Second thing to say in that context, of these 15 countries, Korea has the best growth environment score. Uh, these, are, these include six macro variables, seven micro, uh, and I'll talk more about Egypt in a second, things like corruption, education, rule of law, uh, and a number of indicators of the use of technology. Korea's GES score is higher than every G7 country uh, except Canada. So quite how, the, 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 the only vague justification for calling Korea a developing country is that it has this odd place called North Korea sitting on top of it. Uh, but if it weren't for that, quite why any of us still do it strikes me as nuts. Uh, but if these countries can get their GS scores to the level of careers, they will fulfill their potential. Uh, the third thing to say in that regard, and what is particularly encouraging, is that all 15 of them, some of them in a rather miserably modest way, but all 15 of them have done things to improve their sustainable growth over the past 13 years that we have comparable data. Uh, and highly encouragingly, it includes the likes of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria's GES score has nearly doubled. It's still at a very low level, but it's nearly doubled. In that context, the fourth thing to say is Egypt. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that the, the red shading is the improvement over the past 13 years. Egypt's uh, one of the lowest scoring places and the one with the least uh, improvements, or second least. And in that context, uh, that's how I sort of look at this crisis. It's sort of not surprising that you're seeing such a people's revolution, because linked to some of the things that are in these GS scores, Egypt's people, where they have access to everything that we have by using the internet and mobile telephones, they want a better life. Uh, and if this revolution delivers things that allow for better educational opportunities for them all uh, and some of the other things that are critical to this, 
then uh, Egypt uh, is going to be a, a pretty important place in world economic affairs 20 years from today. And, uh, and this is the bit which is so intriguing as we watch another country getting dragged into it by the day, for the whole of the Middle East and North African region, they could collectively have the impact uh, of one of the four BRICs. <coughs> Um, at the core of all of this is, of course, China. <clears throat> I thought I'd show you this quickly. <clears throat> uh, for the past 13 years, we've had our own, as we do for many places, our own proprietary indicators for following them. Uh, I often joke to people, see, um, this is at a, a UK, uh, obviously, heavy conference. China's GDP data might be bad, but it's not as bad as the UK's. Uh, both of them are pretty useless. <clears throat> uh, but because China's GDP data has inadequacies, uh, we have our own coincidence uh, GDP indicator, which you can see here in yellow, and the red line is a lead indicator. And it's, what you can simply see is the remarkable gyration that China's gone through uh, in the three years since the crisis. China did slow down dramatically. Not surprising for a country uh, going into the crisis that had 12% of its exports to the US. Uh, but because of the enormous stimulus, you can see this quite remarkable, uh, excessive recovery that China had. Uh, but because of the tightening of policy they've been doing for the past 12 months, uh, China is uh, in the process of slowing down. And one of the reasons why I do not share the concern about inflation, in inflation is because the leading indicators that I've followed for years suggest that China is in the process of, of, of softening. Uh, interestingly, the lead indicator shows some evidence of bottoming out. Uh, I've got some stuff in here about the US, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that. As an aside, uh, uh, and, and mentioned uh, by the, my fellow panelists here, uh, there are indications that the US economy is on the way back. Uh, I've been in the pessimistic camp about the US for most of the past decade, uh, but from 40,000 feet, uh, in my opinion, this crisis is solving the biggest challenge the US has had, and that's no domestic savings rates. Uh, and all the indicators that I track for the US suggest uh, since the second half of last year, the US economy might be this year's surprise. Uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, here is another uh, reason why I, I'm in a different world. Uh, to quote again the four tops record. Here's a picture of uh, retail sales spending in the four brick economies in the US. Uh, and in this sort of somewhat nonsensical concept of decoupling or recoupling, which I guess uh, with some of my colleagues I've been partly guilty for over the years, uh, there has been decoupling from the US consumer for many years in these countries. Uh, it's just that people can't get their heads around it. And you can see it even more clearly on this chart arguably the most important one that I'm showing you this morning. Uh, the red line, this, this is effectively a picture of global shopping. The red line is world retail sales adjusted for inflation. Uh, the blue line uh, is uh, retail sales in the uh, so-called, inappropriately so, emerging world. Uh, and at the bottom uh, is the position in the advanced world. Um, you literally have to think upside down uh, of how I've been raised uh, for the past 30 years professionally because these countries are driving global consumer spending. Uh, the four BRIC countries and the next 11 countries are at the core of this. Right now, they are adding, uh, or this year, they will add collectively about a trillion dollars uh, in, in nominal terms to global consumer spending. And if they carry on at the same pace, before this decade is over, the total value of their consumer spending will be bigger than the United States. Uh, as anybody involved, well, if any of you here are involved in uh, particularly a branded goods uh, consumer company, you would know that that is the case. If you are and you don't, then your company needs to find something different to do. Uh, a couple of other things about China. Uh, uh, particularly ahead of the G7 finance ministers this meeting. It is very politically popular uh, for politicians, especially in Washington, but also a number of parts of Europe, when they're not having a bash at banks, they decide they'll have a bash at China. 
Uh, but China, as this chart shows, uh, imports a significantly higher share of its GDP than the US. Last uh, Monday, sorry, Monday of this week, we got the January trade data, uh, and uh, China, as with many Asian countries, reports its trade data pretty quickly. Uh, uh, but uh, what was already evident, at the end of last year, for the data for the whole of last year, China's imports increased by $400 billion last year. China imported two Egypts in one year, or the quarter of an India. Uh, and on the current pace, uh, Chinese total imports at $1.4 trillion could actually be bigger than the US uh, in another five years. So the idea that China's growing at everybody else's expense uh, is as outdated, uh, not quite as outdated as the four tops, but certainly uh, a very outdated idea. And, and one of the questions that somebody from the floor asked, uh, ironically, I have a picture of it here in my charts, because one of the most interesting and complicated things I've seen for years is this. Uh, it is quite remarkable. Here is a picture of German exports over the past three years. And German exports to China are literally booming. And maintained at anything close to the current pace, and a huge complication for EMU, in my opinion, is another 18 months' time, possibly less, German trade with China will be bigger than German trade with France. And any of you that go and visit German Mittelstand companies or, or the big guys in Munich, you would walk out of there thinking that what's going on in China is a lot more important for Germany than anything going on in Europe, so long as Germany doesn't have to spend too much money on the rest. Uh, and so to finish off with, I'll leave you with this chart, which is my Stand Up for the Champions one. Um, in terms of approaching uh, investments, uh, especially in my, my new life as chairman of GSAM, uh, I, I adopt a rather simple uh, approach, which I call the equity risk premium approach, uh, in which it uh, assumes that the, the key guide to equities is where the equity risk premium is today compared to uh, the past, and of course where it might go in the future. Uh, but it, uh, it, it assumes, and I'm a strong believer in this based on some research I've been involved in and, and others have done, uh, that the best guide to equities, both relatively and absolutely on a five-year basis, is today's equity risk premium. And the higher it is compared to the past, uh, the more likely it will come down and equities will do well. And the lower it is, the more likely it will go up and equities will do poorly. Three things to, to point out. Uh, if you look at uh, down the left-hand column, and here I use trend GDP growth as a proxy for trend earnings, uh, because of the four BRIC countries, global GDP growth is probably trending higher than most people realize. The past 25 year, years on a PPP basis, the world has grown by about 3.7. Because these countries are now important, 25 years ago they were not, if you do the simple calculations, it suggests the world economy's growth trend is close to 4.5%. And that's why many multinational companies that are exposed to these countries uh, frequently find themselves delivering positive earning surprises. And it might be, linking into some of the things Andrew uh, was mentioning, it might well be why some of them that are in the UK think they have pricing power. Um, the second uh, interesting thing about this is it particularly because of the caution of many Western central banks, not just the Bank of England, many others. Uh, of course, real bond yields, uh, despite this dreaded sovereign crisis that everybody worries about all day long, uh, despite that, real bond yields are very low compared to their own past, and certainly much lower than trend GDP. Uh, which means that today's equity risk premium is particularly high uh, and suggests to me uh, that because of the BRIC and uh, other growth economies, global equity markets are going to continue to surprise people and keep rallying. And with that, I shall stop. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, uh, Jim. Uh, then the title of this conference is Britain in the Global Economy. Um, why do you think uh, Britain notoriously has failed so far to really capitalise on the, this growth story you're outlining in the BRICS countries in the next 11 um, in, in such con sharp contrast, for example, to Germany? Um, I have to be careful what I say here because the media's around, isn't it? Uh, I guess I'd say three things about it. Uh, actually, but as an aside, this rather populist uh, notion that, that was in the media, encouraged by the government, I guess, when they were supporting Ireland, it isn't actually true that we export more to Ireland than the BRICS. It was, but even for the UK, the pace of our export growth uh, by our own poor standards is such that when we get the full data for last year, which, of course, an another set of data which isn't particularly accurate in the UK, uh, it, it will show that the UK does export more to the, to the BRIC countries than Ireland. Um, but I think there's, there's maybe three reasons. Um, the early beneficiaries uh, primarily of, of this uh, are more likely to be uh, those that are excel in manufacturing, uh, which is why Germany, uh, in my judgment, benefits from it more than anybody else. Um, and the UK uh, as we all know, doesn't have the same uh, depth uh, in manufacturing as the likes of a Germany. Uh, and so that's the, ma the main reason. Uh, secondly, uh, and this is why policy in the UK has to be so careful, uh, because of the mess that we've gone through, and my, my industry has been obviously greatly uh, uh, complicit in, uh, it is currently fashionable to try and uh, destroy some of the things that we have a natural edge in. Uh, and uh, I suspect that even despite that, uh, going forward, uh, financial services uh, could be an even bigger share of UK GDP. Certainly overall services could be. Uh, the English language, the time zone, uh, and knowledge stuff will be increasingly what all these places want as they get wealthier. Uh, and so the UK, particularly, uh, you know, I often think of London as, a, as, a, as the brick capital of the world. Uh, you know, the, U the UK should be in a position to, to start benefiting from it more, but not if we have uh, uh, a populist uh, era where, where policymakers uh, think inwardly uh, about, particularly about things that have happened in the past rather than the future. And I, I think that is absolutely key. Uh, and I think the third factor, which is the flip side of, of much of Andrew's concern about inflation, is uh, uh, before the crisis, I think you could argue that on a competitive basis, the pound had been significantly overvalued. Uh, and, and certainly when I look at it on the, on the things we use, and, and importantly, what I hear from many of my own contacts in business, the UK's competitive position is now probably better uh, than it's been for 20 years. So I think the three things together. Let me just um, put one point you made. You said that some of the, um, the emerging markets, if we don't want to use that term anymore, anyway, what, whatever we call them, have, in your words, a bit of an inflation issue. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to put that to, to Andrew, actually. I mean, would you um, take quite such a kind of benign... Uh, view of the inflation trends in some of these other uh, economies, or are you concerned that they, like the Bank of England, uh, risk getting behind the curve? Well, I'm not sure I want to comment on their policies. I think one of the issues emerging market economies have, they don't have perhaps a, a sort of well-developed monetary mechanisms that we have, and um, on the other hand, sometimes they have uh, sort of more direct interventions into the economy, which, which could potentially be more effective for them. But I think the, the concern I would have is that the flip side of the picture that Jim's describing, um, which is one of pretty strong global growth driven by Asia and emerging markets, will continue to put upward pressure on the things that the world is struggling to produce enough of, which is energy and commodities. And I think Jim's comment on the pricing climate was interesting. We'll continue to create in, in manufacturing industry and in the goods sector a fairly benign pricing climate for companies who are you know, reasonably competitive and switched on to the international economy. Um, now, we have a lot of UK companies operating in the UK. They may not be UK-based companies, but they are 
uh, international companies, and therefore our pricing climate is affected by what's going on internationally. Um, so I, I actually um, very much agree with Jim's analysis on the demand side. My worry would be, you know, the, the flip side of that for global inflation, and then what that means for what um, more mature industrialised economies like the UK should do about it uh, is, a, is going to be quite a dilemma. I mean, I mean just, one, just yeah. one quick thing. I mean, I could talk a lot about that, but well, an irony of this is, uh, as it relates to China at least, which is so much at the core of it, um, China's current major challenge policy-wise is to make sure inflation doesn't rise much. And if Washington shut up for five minutes, it, they would probably be perfectly happy to uh, accelerate the, uh, the appreciation of the RMB because they can't control global commodity prices, or, although their demand factor alone probably is close to having the biggest influence on it, if not the, but they can control the renminbi price. Uh, but they don't like being told what to do, surprisingly. Uh, and the best thing that Washington could do about it is stop going on about it, because they are, they are allowing the renminbi to rise anyhow. Let me um, open it up to the, to the floor um, and see if any have questions uh, for, for Jim or indeed anyone else on the panel um, in this final session before the coffee. Yes. Uh, Martin Burrells with Stanley Gibbons. Uh, don't governments quite like inflation, really, particularly <laughs> if they're in a bit of a financial mess? Uh, isn't it? Inflation really the equivalent of clipping the coinage in medieval times and before that. So I, I wonder whether you can make any comments of, about the political aspects of inflation and the attractions to the people who are sat in uh, uh, as chancellors and what have you around the world. My, my own view is uh, I've, often, I've often thought uh, a tiny bit of inflation that nobody talks about wouldn't go amiss in some countries. The, the problem with that is, uh, again, in, in, a, in an age of such powerful technology and knowledge, it, it's, it, it's, tough to, it, it's certainly tough to get away with that in financial markets. Uh, you know, your infamous bond vigilantes uh, are there as sort of like the policemen. Uh, but interestingly, in the context, again, of what's going on in, in North Africa and the Middle East, uh, linked to the food price issue, that, that appears to have been what started all of this off in Tunisia. Um, so, it's not that easy for governments to get away with it. Andrew, would you agree with that? Well, as Unless a member of the, the Monetary UK. Policy Committee, well. I, I would <laughs> absolutely agree that we, we, sh we shouldn't be letting inflation get out of control. But I think this, is, this argument that says, oh, you know, maybe a bit of inflation is a good thing, governments want inflation. You know, we have been round this sort of spiral or this circle before. Uh, those views you heard more, more in the 60s and early 70s and then we discovered that um, once we let it get out of the bag, we found it very difficult to control. Um, and I think if you look at some of the successful economies in the industrialized world that Jim talks about, such as Germany, which I think in both Rogers and Jim's presentation featured as quite a good model of a successful economy, they took quite a hawkish view um, to inflation historically and have done since. Um, and the best climate, I think, for building real wealth is one in which you don't try and build artificial wealth, uh, which then um, sort of crumbles in your hands. In other words, you keep money values pretty solid um, and concentrate the uh, wealth-creating community in the business sector on generating real value added, uh, not chasing after inflation. Roger, do you think people are too, are too worried at the moment about, about inflation, is it? Yeah, I, I don't think myself that um, very many Western governments will openly embrace inflation. And on recent evidence, I don't think many central banks will go down that route. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're, my, my suspicion is that this view that's quite now prominent in the markets, that surely inflation is the way out, that this is actually um, not giving sufficiently careful attention to history uh, in a number of respects. I mean, for Andrew referred to the 60s and 70s. In so many ways, the inflation that was let loose in the 1970s caused major problems for the economy. I mean, you can overdo it. Certainly, deflation uh, has its problems. But, I mean, if you got a marked reaction by the bond markets to high inflation, this could have a devastating consequence for both for real investment and indeed for consumption. There are circumstances, I think, in which 
the government debt position can be alleviated, at least in the short term, through a burst of inflation. But um, it is very much in the short term. If, if a government's then saddled with very high bond yields, uh, it could act, there are actually circumstances in which letting inflation loose worsens the government debt position rather than improves it. Now, unfortunately, um, that, that then leads on to the, the question of government's time horizons. I mean, um, if you had a government really up against it with a fairly short time horizon, so many of them do have very short time horizons, you can imagine, I think, how they might operate in such a way as to let a little bit of inflation creep in, thinking it would partly solve the, the problem. But certainly if they were strong and looking forward a fair few years and acting in the interests of the economy overall, I don't believe that a rational government in the West would openly embrace higher inflation. There's a question at the back. Hi, it's uh, James Schroeder from uh, Westpac. Um, I think it was the Kiwis in 1988 that uh, first started uh, uh, targeting inflation by, with an in independent central bank. Australia followed Sweden. The, the UK started in 1997. Um, so it's really only a fairly recent phenomenon, you know, targeting monetary aggregates and current account deficits and so on. Used to be the norm in, in the 70s and 80s in various jurisdictions. And even in the US now, they're not, they don't really formally target uh, inflation. How, how long do you think it's going to last as the, as the current sort of norm for, for monetary policy? What, what, what do you think is the, going to be the next thing that monetary policy is going to be uh, aimed at? Jim, do you want to start off on that one? Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about it linked to partly what, what I, I've been asked to talk about here. You know, some of these big uh, growth economies are tar uh, targeting inflation at the core of the... Um, p modern policies. The whole reason why I, I put Brazil in there nine and a half years ago, contrary to the advice I was given, is because of inflation targeting. Uh, arguably, Brazil is a new country uh, because of the success of inflation targeting. So again, as, as sort of implied by, by, by the tone of your question, if not the exact words, that inflation targeting may have last, passed its best time because of the complications the West is in. Uh, from a global perspective, I, I do not think that's the case. One, one of the things that some of these big population countries need to do, as Andrew's touched on, is to, is to have a bit more of that. And, and for places like Brazil, and controversially, I would also say to some extent, more than people in the West realize, China, uh, it's very important. And I, I agree with what Roger said. I, you know, the reason why inflation targeting appeared was because of the complications uh, and, the, and the stability of monetary aggregates, really, uh, in my view. Uh, and despite the problems we've got in the UK with inflation being above target and some of the issues elsewhere, there's, there's a particularly unique dilemma Germany might have, I'll touch on briefly. Uh, it, it, it's a great thing in a democracy to show all your people very easily you know, what's guiding policy. Uh, and it has enormous standards. The, the peculiarity in Germany, I was thinking about it more and more as Roger was showing, Germany might actually, if, if the ECB's job is to target just below 2% inflation, uh, if, the, if the Club Med guys aren't going to be there for permanent deflation, a new additional challenge for Germany, which none of them really realise yet, is they might actually have to have inflation close to 3% for a while, um, because you don't get an average of 2% otherwise. Uh, but... Uh, I think inflation targeting is not past its sell-by date. It's, uh, it's very useful. Um, Andrew, I'm sure you'd agree with that, but isn't there um, a sense that, you know, over the past decade or so, by focusing so much on, on one indicator, the Bank of England lets its eye get off the ball? Well, I think the era in which we targeted inflation, say, from 1997 to 2007, there were some favourable factors, and some of those favourable factors... Uh, which I mentioned in my speech of a, a disinflationary global climate are not present now, and they make inflation targeting more challenging. But I, I, would, I would challenge slightly the notion that inflation targeting is a sort of newfangled idea. It's an embodiment, actually, of a very old idea, which is that sound monetary policy has a sound nominal anchor for money, money values. Um, and it, in a sense, it's a, it's a modern practical manifestation of that. Um, and, you know, there may be scope for different countries to uh, adapt that concept in, in different ways. But 
Um, I think, uh, for, for my money, it's probably the most stable uh, monetary regime that the UK has had uh, in my professional life, and I think we should, we should stick with it and make it work. Time for one more. I'm sorry, we are running oh, over, actually. Oh, sorry, Roger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there are two issues here which you shouldn't conflate. One is independence, and the other is inflation targeting. They're not the same thing. Uh, now, with regard to central bank independence, things could change, in my view, uh, in the sense that the Monetary Policy Committee in this country could make a complete mess of the current um, management uh, challenge. And it could do that, I guess, in two directions, unsurprisingly. It could be that we've completely failed to control inflation rising very sharply, which would be Andrew's major danger. I'm actually more concerned about the opposite risk. That's to say that, pushed by Andrew and maybe some friends on the committee, uh, interest rates go up far too soon, far too much. And in the context of fragile demand and the fiscal tightening, uh, we get uh, a fallback into recession and the Bank of England looks to have made an appalling error. And in those circumstances, I think the political pressure on the bank will be enormous. So there are real deficiencies. There's no, nothing easy about setting monetary policy. But if one looks back at the record in this country, I think you have to say, it's a bit like Churchill said about, about democracy, it's the worst system of government ever invented apart from all the others. Now, I well remember an occasion when, on his way to India, John Major uh, heard that a Conservative MP had died, thought to have committed suicide or the, uh, some unfortunate accident, which I won't go into, and there was a great scandal about um, what had happened. Uh, and uh, seeking to bolster sentiment and support in the Conservative Party, uh, he, of course, ordered an interest rate cut. Uh, now, in my early uh, years in the city, trying to forecast interest rates, and I've been doing that throughout the whole of my career, um, a pretty good way of doing it under the sort of Lawson period was to mark in a cut uh, in budget week, would be March, <laughs> and another one in October, uh, which was the week of the Conservative Party conference. This mixed double uh, paid fantastic <laughs> rewards at the time. We've come a very long way, I think, since then. So getting interest rates setting out of the political arena for all the faults on the MPC, I think has been tremendously valuable. Now, on the second point about inflation targeting, I do myself think that I'm more critical of it than, uh, than uh, the other two speakers. I think there's been a bit of an over-concentration on a narrowly defined measure of inflation, CPI, uh, and I would have placed much more importance on asset prices, and I think this is what's going to happen in the medium term. That's to say, not an abandonment of the idea that we want low and stable inflation, but rather, I think, less slavish attention to a particular measure of it on the short term. And in particular, I think that a central bank should be more focused on Andrew's idea about you know, secure nominal anchor. I agree with all that. But if you have in a system CPI inflation close to target, but you have the largest asset class in the economy, namely residential housing, going up at an annual rate of 20 25%, one way or another, this is going to end in tears. What's going to happen is either that rate of inflation in the asset market is going to spill over into other things and you're going to get an inflationary disaster, or it's going to crash before then and you're going to get a deflationary disaster. And I, I think that the task for monetary policy makers is therefore more complex. And I suspect we are going to evolve away from the narrow interpretation under which the MPC operated. But just to say, I think that by and large, they've done a pretty good job in difficult circumstances and infinitely better than what went before. Listen, I'm going to have to call it uh, to a halt there because we're running over. I'll resist the temptation to add yet another pop music metaphor and just thank very much uh, the panel and say coffee is next.